Please be seated. There is a young man in Ottawa, Canada these days. His last name is Hammond, and he is the backup to the backup goalie of the Ottawa Senators. Uh, they had a goalie who was really good, and then he got injured. So the backup goalie came in and was playing, and he got injured. So they had to go down to the minor leagues and pull up this guy that nobody ever heard of, who hadn't been having a particularly good year, and they brought him up, and they put him in goal, and everybody groaned and said, this is going to be a disaster. And then he wouldn't lose. I think it's 13 games in a row that this kid won. 20 years old, I think. And he won, and he won, and he won, and suddenly everybody's calling him not Hammond, but the Hamburglar, because he wouldn't let any of them go by. He was catching all of them. He was, he was robbing them of their goals. The other day, this kid who had gone from obscurity to sudden fame, where everybody loves him and everybody's got hamburgers now. They're all going to hamburgers. You see the old McDonald's hamburger? That's where they get the name from. They, it got so bad that the senators had to put out a request to their fans not to throw hamburgers onto the ice in homage to this kid. He was the best thing that had ever happened to hockey in the world. And then the other day, he lost a game. Badly. And then he lost another. And I don't know if you ever follow sports comment, mess, the comment boards, but all of a sudden, you got all these comments like, see, I told you it's just a flash in the pan. See, I told you he was too young to do this. He's no good. They should send him back to the miners. Think about what this kid must be feeling right about now. He goes from relative obscurity to his, which is also means kind of lower stress in a lot of ways. And then all of a sudden, he is in the limelight. The entire city of Ottawa thinks he is like the next best thing in the world. And now he's got people saying he's a, he's a bum. It's this thing sort of like emotional whiplash. He goes, this way, then that way, it was whipped back again. And I'll bet you, you're familiar with that in your own life to a degree. I'll give you a tiny little example out of my life. It was my first birthday as a priest. When I was first ordained, I was, uh, my, my job was twofold. One was, I was in charge uh, as a chaplain at a nursing home. And the other part of my job was I was in charge of the youth group. And as it happened, my birthday that year was on a Saturday, so I started off the morning with uh, the prayer group from the nursing home, so I had all the folks there. And they had a nice little birthday party for me, which I, which I thought was cute. It was great. And you know, they had the cake, and then they said, so how old are you? And I said, how old do you think I am? And they all said, oh, you're such a baby. You can't be 20 years old. <laughs> It was, my, it was my 30th birthday, so it wasn't out of it, but I thought, well, this is great, they can continue to do that. Then I go to the youth group meeting, and they have a birthday party. And they have a little cake, and they say, so how old are you? And I said, how old do you think? And one of the kids, without taking a breath, says, 50? <laughs> more seriously, though, and more often, there's times when I will be sitting with someone as they are dying. And then I will leave and go to another hospital and hold a newborn baby. Or go to the office and do a premarital counseling. Or do a wedding. Or indeed, go to the youth group. There's a lot of shifting from one thing to another. And it is kind of hard sometimes to move from one thing to another. It's even harder when you're moving from something you expect to something you don't. I don't know if you've ever been called into an office and you think you're going to get praise for doing something really great and then instead you get a pink slip. Or the opposite. You think you really messed up and they come in and say, you're the hero of the day. 
It almost doesn't matter which direction. Your brain is going from here to here, and your heart is going from here to here. I bring this all up because this emotional whiplash, as it were, is part of what we do today. It's part of what we do this whole week. You may ask yourself, why? Why do we do this on Palm Sunday where we start off over there and everybody's, you know, we read this gospel passage where Jesus is coming in and everybody's saying, Hosanna, which means save us. You know, they think of Jesus as a savior. And then we come over here through the freezing cold and we come into a nice warm church and then we say, crucify him. You may ask yourself, why do we do this in one whole day when we've got all of Holy Week to get there? Well, there's one cynical answer, and that is the church doesn't actually entirely trust everybody here to come to every single Holy Week service. Now, I know that you will, but they don't trust everybody. So they try to get the whole thing into one day from the entrance into Jerusalem all the way over to the crucifixion. Because that's important. But the other reason is because it's important to understand this emotional whiplash. It's, emo it's important to <coughs> remember what that feels like and then put yourself in the position of those who are there. Think about being one of those disciples. Now, these are kids, like the hamburger, about his age. They're my kids' age, for goodness sake. These are older teenagers, young 20s. That's all. They're going in there. They know something's up. They're terrified. They're nervous. And then all of a sudden, everybody's sitting in there saying, here, you know, hey, I have the coffee. Hero, here comes Jesus. He's going to save us. Yay. And they're putting poems on the ground. And they're putting their books on the ground. And everybody's happy. And everybody's wonderful. And the disciples are thinking, hey, this isn't so bad after all. This is awesome. But less than a week later, they're grieving and they're terrified. Or put yourself in the place of the people who are greeting Jesus in there. They've been looking for all these years for a son Messiah, a hero who's going to save them. And especially now that they're suffering under the Romans, they hear about this Jesus who does all these incredible things, and he's going to come and save them. And there he comes through the gates, and they're cheering. He's wonderful. They are excited to see him. They are truly, truly happy. And then he turns out to be a fraud, or so they think. He turns out to be just a huckster, somebody who's faking it. So they've been told by their leaders, and they're curious. How could he do that to them? How could he fool them like that so cruelly? He deserves to die, doesn't he? And so now they're angry. And maybe later, Confused, ashamed, perhaps. We would do well to put ourselves in the place of the Roman soldiers, too. Because think about who they are. Most of them aren't that old. Most of them aren't from there. They're in a foreign country. They're the occupying force. They're there because they're told to be there. They're scared because there's Passover coming, and it's always a tinderbox. They've already had revolts and rebellion, and now this guy, Jesus, comes in and people are calling him the Savior, the one who's going to keep them out. They've got to be on pins and needles as he comes in. And maybe during the week they get a little breath of, of uh, relief because he doesn't seem to be you know, raising any armies. But then it gets bad again. And they have to be on high alert because now he's been arrested. And everybody's all up in the air. They nobody knows what's going on. Think about them. How they're going from one extreme to another. Even think about the high priests and what's going through their minds and through their hearts. They've got this thing they've been protecting for centuries. 
this is the way it is, this is the way it's supposed to be. Why is this guy messing with things? Not only is it their comfort that is, and their power that's threatened, but their whole way of life. They are furious with Jesus. They wish he would just stop. And then when the crucifixion comes, they don't know how to feel either. Are they heroes? Are they goats? No offense. Who are they? So everybody there is going from here to here. And I don't really have a theological point to make with it. Just a human point. That every single person there was real. It wasn't just something that we read in a church on a Sunday. There were people and they were terrified, or they were angry, or they were ecstatic. They had all these feelings. And what I would like to invite you to do is to feel those feelings. To walk with them through this week. And when they are de delighted, be delighted. And when they are angry, be angry. And when they're scared, be scared. What they did is real. These are real people. These are God's people, as are all people. And that's why it matters. That's why it matters that we come today and why we come on Monday, Thursday, where you can come and be part of them as they observe this Last Supper, this institution of the Eucharist. That's why it's important to come on Good Friday where we all gather at Regina Celli and we walk and we carry that cross around town. And we walk with them. That's why it's important on Good Friday evening to come in and have a veneration of the cross and the, the solemn collapse where we really feel and, you, and as you leave, we really get a nail to remind you but that's us too. That's why it's important on good on, on Holy Saturday to come to the vigil where we light the new fire in the middle of the darkness. We bring light out of darkness. We bring life out of death. And that's why it's important to come on Easter morning when we share this incredible delight and the sun is shining and it's going to be so much warmer than it is today. It will be. <clears throat> but to come and to share that joy and that relief and that exaltation that can really only come after you've been dragged through the mud, all I can really do today is to invite you to be part of that. Because when you and I walk with them through the pain, through the fear, and through the joy, then we know that this is real and that Christ is alive and that we are part of that. That's a lot to go through. And there's a lot of emotional whiplash back and forth. So buckle up, because it's going to be a bumpy ride. Amen.